Welcome to Killer Women with your host, best-selling author, Danielle Girard. The Killer Women Vodcast is pleased to be a part of the Authors on the Air Global Radio Network. To learn more about Danielle and her books, visit her at www.daniellegirard.com and to access all of our vodcasts, go to youtube.com forward slash authors on the air. And now, Danielle's next killer woman. Welcome to the Killer Women podcast, a proud member of the Authors on the Air Global Network with over 4 million listeners. I am your host, suspense author Danielle Gerard, and today's guest is Jess Lowry. Jess writes about secrets. She's the Amazon charts best-selling Edgar Agatha and Lefty nominated, Anthony and Thriller Award winning author of crime fiction, nonfiction, children's books, YA adventure, and magical realism. She is a retired professor of creating, creative writing and so, sociology, a recipient of the Lofts Excellence in Teaching Fellowship, a Psychology Today blogger, and a TEDx presenter. Check out her TEDx talk for the surprising inspiration behind her first published novel. When not leading women's writing retreats, reading, traveling, or fostering kittens, you can find Jess drafting her next story. Welcome, Jess. Thank you. I'm so happy to be here. Thanks for having me. Oh my God, so exciting. So um, everyone's going to be listening to this on November 1st, which is the, the official um, pub date for the Quarry Girls. But today is October 4th, and that book, the book's available a whole month early. And just, just out of curiosity, Jess, um, where is it on the Amazon store today? <laughs> it's number one. I can't. I can't even believe it. It's number number one, one in yeah. the Amazon store. That happened to me with one book, and is it not the most fun thing? You just want to watch it all day long. I know. It's, it. I'm not getting any writing done because I keep refreshing that page. <laughs> yeah, and you get screenshot. You got to screenshot it a million times so yeah. that you can relive it. It's so exciting. Well, congratulations. Thank so you. So tell our listeners a little bit about the Corey Girls. The Quarry Girls is set in 1977, St. Cloud, Minnesota. And St. Cloud is a real town in Minnesota. It's population maybe oh, 65,000 right now. But when I lived there in the 70s as a child, obviously as a tiny child. Exactly. <laughs> when you were born. <laughs> when I was, I was born. Um, it, it was a smaller town, but it was, uh, it's, it remains close knit, right? It's got that Midwestern, everybody knows everybody feel to it. And in the 70s, there were two and possibly three serial killers operating, and they've never caught the third, which is why I say maybe. Um, and it became an environment of fear. Uh, and they didn't talk to us kids about what was happening. Of course, how do you tell kids that there's a serial killer out there? But we could sense it. We knew that it was a sort of immersively terrifying environment. And so the Corey girls fictionalizes that period of time and uses 1977 as sort of the touch point for exploring what what it does to a community when you have serial killers active. Yes. And let's, so let's talk about serial killers, Jess, because I think you, you know, you're sort of a self-professed serial killer obsessed, you know, interest. You have, you yeah. have a super interest in serial killers. And is, there, is that because you think of the, of where you grew up? I think so. I mean, of course, it's gruesome. Of course, it's a gruesome fascination. Sorry, right, hang on. Yeah. <laughs> okay, Jess, so let's talk about serial killers, because you really have an interest in, in them that, you know, goes beyond maybe what we would consider the usual. And um, where does that come from, do you think? I, I really do think it was growing up in that period of time and knowing that there was something in the background lurking and feeling like if I could get enough research, if I could find answers, uh, that I could protect myself. And then as I grew up, that I could protect my children, uh, which is, of course, uh, it's false security because it's such a random crime most of the time. Yeah. And so I don't like I don't know the facts of serial killers. I just sort of know the motivation often and, and things you that I thought I could do to protect myself. Yeah. Well, especially since you, like you said, you, you're somebody who explores secrets. And one of the things that's very evident in this book and very interesting, I think, of the, this book, which you do so well, is that time period, we really didn't tell kids about scary things, right? We sort of avoided um, the truth about what's sort of out there. And this, you know, our main character in the book really explore, you know, is learning a lot about real life at this moment, right? 
Right. And how to communicate because and, it, and in Minnesota, at least, it's not just the 70s. We often don't talk about the things that are happening as if by looking away, they go away. And I find that it's the exact opposite, right? If we don't right. talk about it, if we don't connect with each other, uh, it allows that thing to fester. And so I've been with my last few books exploring what it's because I moved from community to community where there are horrible crimes happening and I'm not responsible for them. You would think I... <laughs> You would think no, 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 we, we wouldn't go there. <laughs> Murder, she wrote thing going on. But right. so I'm sort of roped into until I can figure out my way out, exploring what it means to be a child surrounded by people who love you and many who don't, who just aren't talking about what, what needs to be talked about. Right. And uh, your books also, I mean, you know, Unspeakable Things, for instance, and Bloodline both deal with sort of, um, you know, kids of this age, of this age group, right? I mean, they're um, in, and people think she might be a little bit younger. Um, mm -hmm. And, but it is about, um, it's, they're so well done because there is that point where we shift between being not really that interested in our surroundings to becoming very sort of aware and then hyper aware of them in that sort of middle, middle age thing. And it's super interesting to explore that. That must interest you a lot. It really does. And so I, as I mentioned, I lived in St. Cloud in the 70s. I was born in 1970. And in fourth grade, we moved to Painesville, which is where Unspeakable Things is uh, is set. And talk about leaving the frying pan to go into the fire, because in Unspeakable Things, I explore what it what it was like to have boys abducted and then returned throughout the 80s when I was living there. And again, nobody talking about it. And so I think I don't know, I think it's so important to to talk about these things, to connect with uh with other people and to not centralize the perpetrator. I would rather hear the stories of the victims and the communities yeah. than, than the monster who, who ripped it all apart. Right, because also we only enhance the interest of other monsters to become known if we focus on the on the perpetrators. So you know, you said unspeakable things was you know based on a I know on a on a sort of true situation. Is this is the Cory girls also sort of based? Is the seed also a true crime? It was actually three true crimes, and so it was a, a, a three three killings. Two of them for sure serial killers, um, and then the third one was uh, was never caught. But they think they know who it was, and he and potentially with a friend kidnapped uh, two girls in nineteen. That one was in nineteen seventy four, um, and murdered them in the quarries of Saint Cloud, mm -hmm. and they were they were found about. 30 days after they went missing because mm -hmm. the police just thought they ran away. Uh, and my heart breaks thinking about, in all of these cases, thinking about the families, right? right. The people left behind and, and what it did to them and how it is to turn to a community that's not really wanting to talk about it because it's, it's ugly, it's scary. Um, and so at the time when you need your community the most, everybody's sort of looking away. Right. And the, the idea that these, that oftentimes, of course, the victims are oftentimes girls, right? Mostly, um, mm -hmm. although obviously there are male victims, but, um, but we, the police in that generation sort of discounted sort of women and girls as their, you know, as sort of smart individuals. Like, you know, there's always a sense of, oh, she ran away from home, but yeah. it didn't really, doesn't mesh with what we, uh, people know about her and, and what her family says about her. And, you know, and then if you're not, you know, super wealthy or super powerful, you know, you get sort of swept girls got swept, you know, under the rug. Absolutely. They were sort of uh, treated as if they were disposable. And if, as if their, their family should take care of it, the police don't really want to get involved. There's a really good podcast called In the Dark. And on their very first episode, or very first season, which I think came out in 2016, they cover these crimes that I write about in the, in the seventies and the eighties, and specifically how the police do not take them seriously and just sort of look the other way. And there's of course a lot of other factors going on, but it's a it's a really damning portrait of of how unsupported these families were at the time. Yeah. Do you think we're better now? You know, it's hard, it's hard to say. I think I think communication improves everything. And I think I see social media being used positively to draw attention to crimes and victims who otherwise might not get as much attention as they deserve. So I yeah. hope I hope that we're better. 
Yeah. And back to sort of on that woman thing, there's also, I love this quote, um, this whole sort of boys, the, you know, boys will be boys, um, mm-hmm. and, which, you know, I think it's bad. We're better at that, but it does, you know, there's the, um, the sh- this is sheriff, right? The sheriff who says, hey, ha- now it's just me- how men are beneath it. How, it's just how men are beneath the nice words and clothes were animals might as well get used to it and yeah. that is such a like you know it's up to you as a woman or a young girl right to keep yourself safe to keep because yeah. you can't you can't depend on the, the the boys to to not act their nature right exactly that idea that somehow it's the victim's fault right and I think I think we still have a lot of work to do that in that area I think you're right we're better I I have a son do you have sons I do have one son and one daughter same exactly and so I think hopefully we're talking to our kids about this and giving boys room to to express their emotions to um, connect with other people and also to do better right yeah yeah yeah, this whole a the you know to have some agency where where we would really let them off the hook for for and still a lot of men get sort of let let off the hook, right? Um, so what so it's so interesting. One of the things I think that comes up with the sort of the idea of these kids keeping secrets is the idea of shame, which is something else we sort of put a lot on girls, right? Yeah. And so you know, do you think that's getting better? Do we are we sort of shaming our women less so they'll more apt to come forward? But that is sort of one of the strongest elements of this book is that the, you know, the kids are sort of, something's implied that they're doing something wrong. And so they keep quiet out of sort of the sense of shame. Right, right. And I don't know if it's cultural or if it's something as humans that we just have to bear, but when something bad happens to us, often shame is the first thing we feel, even if it's not our fault, especially if it's not our fault. And so I don't know if we're getting any better at that, but I do know there's so many amazing women and men who are speaking out Mm -hmm. about what's happened to them and putting ownership of of the negativity on the perpetrator. Like that's not mine, that's that's yours to figure out. And I think seeing those brave people speak out uh, gives other people permission and a path if they want to, if they want to speak out. So I think we still have, I know I still have that shame reaction, but yeah but I see a different way. I see a different way. Yeah, I think that's right. And one of, you know, you're obviously, you know, you studied a lot of things and you're clearly very interested in psychology and you do, um, you're both a teacher and lead retreats. Tell us about that. Cause I think a women's retreat sounds amazing. Yeah. And I want to sign up where, yeah. what, tell, tell us what you do on those. You know, I had two this year, uh, of course, COVID kind of, uh, took care of most of my other planned ones, but I had one in February in Costa Rica and one in May in Italy. <sighs> and they are amazing. And, and it's not anything I do. It's it just, they call to these amazing women and we go to this beautiful locale. We have five days of workshops. So the morning the mornings are all workshops. Uh, there's one-on-ones with me and I usually bring another writer with to make sure everybody gets a lot of attention. And it's just a week to, to focus on writing, to yeah. just sit around and talk to other people who are focused on writing and to give yourself permission to nap to write to go to the spa to just to just not worry about anybody but yourself for a whole week it's this amazing time which is something women don't do very often oh no we don't we absolutely do not because there's so many things people relying on us but i think if we don't fill the well whatever that looks like for everybody if we don't fill the well um we just get exhausted we're not good we're not good for ourselves we're not good for anybody yeah, I think that's so true. And so um, basically, most of your ideas come from these true um, stories. You have sort of a, you know what your, what the next one is. You always have sort of a, something boiling in the back of your brain. Obviously, you're working on another book now. Yeah. Um, is it also seated in a true story? You know, I was, uh, up until last March, I was writing my next book for Thomas and Mercer, which is which is our publisher. I was writing a uh, true crime inspired story about a town between St. Cloud, which is where the Quarry Girls is set, and Painesville, which is where Unspeakable Things is set. And a college student disappeared from there in the 90s. And he was never found. And then it turned out that there were 30 to 50 white male college students in that 10 year period who disappeared in very similar ways. And they haven't, they've been connected by a few people, but not really 
on the wow. law enforcement level. So I was writing that book, but I also uh, was in Costa Rica and got my editor said, can you write the short story set in Costa Rica? And I said, absolutely. And I wrote it and she really liked it. And she said, can you table the true crime inspired book and write a whole novel about these short story characters? So that's what I'm working on right now. It's totally out of my comfort zone. It's sort of a police procedural, mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. but I don't know a lot. Of, <laughs> I don't know a lot about police procedurals. So I gave it sort of an X-Files vibe too, because yeah. I loved the X-Files. And so yeah. I'm working on that. And then I'm hoping to circle back to, to uh, the, the other, other book. Yeah. 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 Uh, so now um, when you, in your process, are you, you know, do you sort of map it out? Do you know you know, so sort of how does that, how does it work? Outlining versus, you know, the pantsing idea. Yeah. And so pantsing is right. You're right by the seat of your pants. Plotting is you, is you outline beforehand. And I think we all fall on that spectrum mm -hmm. and it depends what project we're doing. What do you do? Are you a pantser? Or a I'm a pantser, but I'm, I'm really looking to be converted. So, it, you know, cause I, what I do is write two books for everyone that, you know, I mean, I write, the equivalent of two books to get one and that's yeah. just not the most um efficient way to work so yeah uh, but i you know i haven't figured out the outlining thing yeah so i i do outline i have something called the book in a bag and i actually i sell little kits it's a note card it's it's just note cards is what it is but it's based on the idea that if you know your a story which is that major plot and your yeah. b story which is your character arc going into the book uh, it's fairly easy to do just a one sentence outline per scene, and then it makes for a cleaner writing process. Yeah. Whether you're a pantser or a plotter, you don't go off into all those little uh, divergent paths. And so that's what I do. And because the cards are colored uh, and I have colored pencils and colored markers and stickers, it makes it sort of play. I mean, it's yeah. still hard, but it makes yeah. it sort of play. So I, so I outline every book. Good for you. Well, I'm going to check out the book in a bag because clearly yeah. that sounds like something I need. So um, <laughs> when you're and so does that do you feel like it's it's a matter of sort of um, when you're when you're doing the outline, are you sort of free free association with things mm -hmm. and um, before so until things click and it's just a process that you sort of spread everything out on the floor? Yeah, for me, I have to find myself in the project. They're all fiction. I have one nonfiction book, but the rest are all fiction. But I still have to find what it means to me. And I think every writer's got this, these themes that we keep exploring. Yeah. And so for me, it's secrets. It really is secrets. And so I have to find out what it is I have to learn in writing that book. And that's what I make the main character have to learn. And then once I do have that, it's sort of free association. And I put in like stuff, you know, this right stuff just appears. You're like, how did I, where did that come from? Right, right, right. right. Or you, well, like, yeah. You're right, you're right. I love that process. Or you repurpose things that have happened, things you've heard. And it just sort of, um, that's the magic of it. That's the magic of writing. I know it is. And it's, it's funny to hear, you know, I've, I've interviewed so many fabulous women with fabulous books and everybody's process, like you said, is a little bit different, which is what's fun. You know, I mean, I think if you, you know, I'm, I'm such a creature of habit that getting me to try something new is really um, difficult, yeah. but I do, every time I hear somebody talk about a process, I'm like, I should try that. I should try it all. <laughs> it's, there's gotta be a better way. So, yeah. well, that is so exciting. Well, the retreats sound amazing too. I love it. And um, I know, I'm, I think I maybe need to sign up for one. That sounds so fun. Um, so tell <laughs> us, you're working on, tell us a little bit, do you have a title for the Costa Rica book? It is called, tentatively, is called The Taken Girls, but it, that's so close to the Quarry Girls that yeah. I don't know if we'll stick with it. I am terrible at titles and character names. I just, I can't, I have a character in a book called Sharpie because there was a Sharpie pen next to me. <laughs> I was, like, this is my creative process when I come up with names and titles. So I trust the folks at Thomas and Mercer to sort that out. But for right now, it's called The Taken Girls. I mean, can you give us a, a, a little premise or you don't want to, <laughs> I, I don't want to put you on the spot. Yeah, no, absolutely. This one, um, I'm in edits of this one. So it's very oh. forefront in my mind, but it is, um, a woman who grew up in a very sort of backward, uh, backward small town, which is everything I write. <laughs> ends They're all up kind in of backward small town. It seems like okay. <laughs> yeah. She ends up working for the BCA, and the BCA is a uniquely Minnesota actual Bureau of Criminal Apprehension agency, and it was started in the twenties to deal with all of the 
um, Chicago mafia guys mm. coming over, the Al Capones just sort of tearing up Minnesota. And so the legislature created the BCA, which has since grown to be this amazing agency that has an incredible forensics department, one of the biggest in, um, in the United States. And I, I figured writing my short story, I'll write about the BCA because nobody's heard of it. I can just, I can just make shit up. But then, now I had to really ah! learn about it because <laughs> it's a whole book. And so anyhow, she ends up working at the BCA. She gets paired with a famous forensic scientist at the BCA. They uh, come across a body where a woman has been buried alive. And she has a connection to some girls who went disappearing in 1980, who disappeared in 1980. So these, the cold case comes together with the hot case and that's the Taken girls. That's so exciting. So it's, yeah. so I love it when you said it was set in Costa Rica, but now it seems like it's not set in Costa Rica. It's not set in Costa Rica. So it was set in Costa Rica, but the agents came down from Minneapolis chasing yeah. a potential serial killer. Uh, and that was the story. Cause the whole, that, that series of six short stories, I wrote one was called the getaway collection. And so it had to be getting away. It had to be some vacation area, but now it's back to Minnesota. I tell you, I think we should be able to write those. You got to write those trips off. That's why you got to write a getaway oh, series. I so, wrote that trip off. I sure I did. You did. Good for you. <laughs> well, there's not, it's not like there's a lot of benefits. We get to buy as many books as we want. And then once in a while we get to write off a trip. So that yeah. seems very fair. If the IRS is listening, that seems completely legit to me. <laughs> totally. Um, okay. So you've got, you've got the Taken Girls coming. Yeah. I'm coming out to the Corey Girls and then you're going to circle back. And then you know, you also like you've written children's books and YA books. Do you sort of yeah. fit those in or is that something you did and you're sort of now onto thrillers? How does that work? You know, I have, I'm working on a dystopic YA novel right now. I've got yeah. some exciting uh, news to share on that one, but the ink's not dry yet. So I'm going to yes. wait till, till the ink dries on that one. Yeah. But I'm working on that one right now while editing uh, The Taken Girls. And then I don't know what's next. I don't know. We'll see. How about you? What are you working on? Oh, I'm I'm um I'm working on the third book in the um, Hagen series. I, j I just finished that, so okay. uh, we'll see how that one goes. And then I have a book that I, you know, when you have a book, you want really need to write. I uh, I wrote it once, and my agent didn't like it, so I'm basically keeping the title and starting again. Okay, can you share the title? The or title is, is the surrogate. Okay. So you you explore secrets. I explore motherhood. Motherhood okay. to me is a really interesting. It's just the ways in which we are, what it takes from us, what it gives us. Um, I'm super interested in that. And I, like you, I have two kids. So you have a girl and then a boy or a boy and then a girl? My girl is 24. She lives in Chicago. My boy is 20 and he just moved home to go back to college. Good for him. So I have an almost 23 year old daughter living in Colorado. And then I have a 20 year old son who did a year in Boston, hated it because he started 2020, which is not the time to start. No. And now he's at in Manhattan at the Fashion Institute. Super what? weird. That's I know, borrowed, borrowed my sewing machine and um, started making men's clothes. So it's oh really, God. and I'm talking about my sewing machine was like $99 from Costco. I'm not, a, <laughs> I'm not somebody who, who has a lot of sewing, but isn't that so funny? And I also was born in 1970, mm. Jess. So we have some uh, we, have, we have lots in common. We, I clearly think it's destiny that I come to a women's writers retreat. That's what I'm, I'm with you. I'm 20, <laughs> 2023. I love it. Well, and, you know, all of your books are, you know, you are really known for writing. There, you go to creepy places, Jess. Yeah. Your brain, you go to creepy, creepy places. And, it, and that is what I think is so fabulous. Uh, about your books is that it's it takes us one step beyond where you know we would go in good company like in proper company right yeah, like yeah. oh wow and I um but it's the real it's sort of a real it's it feels very authentic and thank so, you um thank you I I'm a big I'm a huge fan and I look forward to the Taken Girls although I think you're right you might you might lose the you might lose the title on that one, um, but I'm sure Thomas and Marissa. Will, I basically feel like it's only about half my books that the title was mine. Um, you know, they usually change. Everybody changes titles. Yeah, their their marketing department is fabulous. I'm gonna let yeah. them do their job. Yeah. Exactly, let them do their job. <laughs> so the Corey Girls out actually early for um, Prime members, um, October first, and number one in the Amazon store. That's amazing. And mm -hmm. uh, and then out today, November first, which is when everyone's gonna get to hear this. It's so wonderful. And if you haven't read Jess Lowry, you got to go back and read some of the earlier ones too, because 
Woo, unspeakable things, Jess. That one was like, that was my first entree into you. And that was, um, right? That was, yeah. well, you know, you wrote it. Yeah. So you know all about it. Okay, so <laughs> tell our listeners where to find, you know, you on social media, on the web, about the retreats and everything. Yeah, I so my website is jessicalowry.com. I'm on Twitter, I'm on TikTok, I'm on Instagram, I'm on Facebook. And the first week of November, I'm doing signings all over the country. And so check out my website and come say hi. So fun. Okay, so Lowry is L-O-U-R-E-Y, just in case exactly. you got listeners, Jess Lowry. Um, well, Jess, thank you so much for joining me today yeah. and for the Corey girls, which, you know, kept me up late and a little too late at night, which is what you do, girl. Um, <laughs> and um, we wish you the best of luck. Thank you. My pleasure. I've had so much fun talking to you. So fun. Okay, this has been Killer Women. Our guest today, Jess Lowry. I'm Danielle Gerard, and we will see you next time. Bye. Bye.